Amen. Our classes are dismissed. Of course, the youth and the children's class, if you just go out that door. But for us adults, we're going to stay up here for just a little bit. If you will, turn with me this morning to the New Testament, to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number three is where we will be at this morning. And in case y'all are wondering, we will return back to the book of Acts next Sunday. We'll jump right back into Acts chapter number three. We'll continue in that study. But I thought we needed maybe something topical uh, here in the month of December. And I want to finish off with just one last thought uh, before we end the month and end the year of 2023. Has this year not went by quite fast? It really has. But this morning, I hope I can be a great blessing to you. Philippians chapter number three. I want to read just a few verses this morning, and then we'll look at them a little bit closer. Philippians chapter three, beginning in verse number 13. The Bible says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mine the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. Benjamin Franklin made the statement, take time for all things. Great haste makes great waste. I want to say that last statement again. Great haste makes great waste. Will you repeat it with me? Great haste makes great waste. Let's do it one more time. Great haste makes great waste. Recently, I was reading the newspaper, which, funny enough, the Greenville newspaper will stop doing a newspaper this new year. We were told that at the radio, so we're going to have a change over there about some things we've got to do. But I don't know about you, but sometimes I like to look at the newspaper, not necessarily at the news, but I always like to go to a certain page that has the comics on it. When I was reading part of it, I saw the Peanuts. How many of you know who the Peanuts are? You know, Charlie Brown, you know, Snoopy. I remember a couple of years ago, we were doing a Christmas play, and we did the Charlie Brown Christmas, and I got to play Snoopy. I was so excited to be able to be Snoopy. But I was reading the Peanuts comic strip just recently, and I read one that involved Lucy. You remember Lucy, uh, that little girl that used to call Charlie Brown a blockhead, you remember, and always was giving him a hard time. Well, in that comic strip, she was grumbling to poor old Charlie Brown and, and complaining about how awful the new year was. She was having, she complained about the problems that were abounding all around her and she felt that there was difficulties on every single corner that she went to. She said to Charlie Brown, I don't think this is a new year at all. I think we've been stuck in a used year. And certainly this year has seemed like a used year. It has been a very hard year for so many. But by the grace of God, we've made it to the last day of the year. Uh, but I, I got thinking recently, uh, as we were getting ready for today, I, I was thinking throughout the week, uh, what could be something that our church needs? Every time that uh, we come together in our Sunday school, I don't want to give just information, though I know that is teaching. I want to give something that can help our church. And I got to thinking about this time of year, uh, that a lot of us do a lot of traveling. 
How many of you went to go visit maybe some family on Christmas Day? Did anybody go visit some family? Or maybe during Thanksgiving, some of you went to go have some time, or maybe they came to you. But there was a lot of traveling. I remember during Thanksgiving, I went with my sister up in Virginia, and we had to go to Washington, D.C. on the day before Thanksgiving. You talk about that airport was quite busy. But there's a lot of traveling that goes on during this time of year, during the months of November and December. Uh, whether that is to go visit family or whether that is to go visit uh, maybe a friend in another state, all of us are always busy this time of year doing a lot of traveling. Uh, maybe this time of year you're already planning some trips you're going to make this new year. Maybe you've already bought some tickets for some cruise that you're going to take. If you're going on a cruise, hey, I would like an invitation. Uh, maybe you're, you're making some trips about some cabin that you're going to want to rent out, maybe spend a few, few days with family away from home. It's always good to get away from home, but man, it feels so much better when you get back home after that long vacation. But maybe some of you are uh, planning just to take a time to go down to the beach for a day or two and just have a good time with the family, whatnot. But some of you are already planning dates of things to do for this new year. Maybe some of you are saving up some money for those trips. Maybe you're saving some money for some missions trip. And all these things are good things and I think needed things in all of our lives. And I think it's a good thing to pre-plan, not somebody just saying, hey, pack up your things, let's go off to do something. I think it's a good idea to have some plans pre-planned. But most of us, Brother Bill, we always like to wait to the very last minute to pack our bags. None of us are packing right now for a trip that we're going to take in July. I don't think any of us are. If you are, you're insane. Ain't nobody doing that. But most of us, we all wait to the very last minute, and especially us men, we like to pack the day of that we're supposed to be getting in the car. Sometimes we're running late behind where we were supposed to leave. I felt that in the last few weeks. But I... I find myself a lot of times on vacation or trips that I'll make, I'll, I'll pack all my things that morning and I'll throw them into the suitcase and then I'll get in the car and start driving. I'll maybe be staying at a hotel or staying at some parsonage. I open up my bag and guess what I find? I'm missing something. I, I, maybe I'm missing a toothbrush. How many of you have ever left your toothbrush behind? How many of you ever left deodorant behind? Everybody knows when you left behind your deodorant. Maybe you left behind some certain shoe uh, that you were going to wear maybe for a special occasion on that trip or maybe a hairbrush, you know, that special hairbrush all of us have. All of us have to have that specific one. But depending what that thing is that you've left behind, you're going to have to make a decision whether how important it really is that you need it. And because you're not probably, depending on how far you travel, you're not going to go back home. You're going to have to make a decision, do I need this particular thing or is it something I need to go purchase a replacement for? And depending where you are, it may be hard to find a Walmart or even a Dollar General, even though there's a Dollar General literally everywhere. But if it's a toothbrush, you're going to want to go get a toothbrush. And all of your family and friends will appreciate it quite much. If you're missing deodorant, your family and friends will greatly appreciate you going and get some deodorant. Or whatever the case may be. But some things we had to leave behind. Or maybe it was a present that we wanted to give. But we can't go get it. We'll have to maybe ship it in the mail at a later time. But either way, if we forget something to pack, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us time because we had to go out and find a store that has that particular thing. And then second, it's going to cost us financially. But you know, as we approach the new year, we need to make sure that we are packed with all the spiritual essentials in order for this new year to be the best year for the White Horse Hides Baptist Church. And so I brought a little thing that I thought would be a great help. I think we have a suitcase right here. This is my personal little suitcase when I travel. Not very big, but it gets the job done for somebody like me. I can pack what I need to do in probably less than about 15 or so minutes. But as we think about getting packed 
for the new year. There's some things I think we all need before we enter into the new year. Otherwise, we're going to enter into the new year unprepared. We're not going to have the essentials that we need, and then we're going to, it may cost us. So this morning, I want us to look particularly here in Philippians chapter number three. In, in, in this particular chapter, Paul has given us some, his spiritual biography. In verses 1 through 11, he tells us a little bit about his past, back when he was a Christian killer, back when he was a very religious man, a very intellectual man. In verses 12 through 16, he tells us a little bit about his present, where he is at that current time. And then in verses 17 through uh, verse number 21, he's going to tell us about his future. He's going to talk a little bit about heaven. And I'm thankful that we have that hope and that promise of heaven that we may not know what tomorrow is, but we do know who holds the future. And Paul knew who, hold, who holds the future. And he already began to encourage this church that had been such an encouragement to him. The book of Philippians is often called the joy book because you find the word joy or the word rejoice so many times. Paul isn't coming to write an epistle to them like he did with the Corinthians where he had to correct issues necessarily. He's not going to deal with them on a doctrinal level like he did in the book of Romans, but he's going to use this as an exhortation to them because they have been such a great help to him. He talks a little bit about that in chapter number four. But Paul is trying to encourage these people in this day and in their hour. You've got to remember, being a Christian in that day, in the Bible days, was not like what it is today. We, we use Christian, the label, so loosely, but in that day, it was a mockery to be called a Christian. They said, oh, that Christian. That was the attitude, and most of the time, they got stoned or killed or martyred, whatever the case was. It was not a good thing to be a Christian in that day, but I'm thankful that there were some that stood the test of time and stood for the faith even in that day and throughout the ages that today you and I can come into a place and worship the Lord freely. But I think there are some things that Paul tells them that I believe I need to tell you this morning so we can pack up, be ready for a new year. I think the first thing that you need to pack in your suitcase for this new year, you're going to need to pack grace. You're going to need to pack grace. We've already established this year it's not been an easy year. But by the grace of God, we've made it this far. But if we're going to make it into the new year, if this new year is going to be the best year, we're going to need grace in our suitcases. We're going to make sure that it's packed there. Now, grace does two things in all of our lives. Number one, it's going to give us a humble attitude. A humble attitude. Look with me at verse number 12. The, uh, yeah, verse number 12. Not as though I had already attained. Now, the word attain here means to receive or to gain or to get or obtain. Then he talks about already perfect. Perfect here, when we think of perfect, we think of something spot, uh, spotless or that with no problems, but that's not what he's talking about. He's saying to make perfect, complete, to accomplish, to finish, or to bring to an end or complete. Here's what Paul is saying in essence right here in verse number 12. He is saying uh, that I haven't arrived yet, and you haven't either. You may have been a Christian for 30 years, but you haven't arrived yet. You're not everything that God wants you to be yet. And we're all in a grace period that we all are to grow in grace on a daily basis. I was talking with my dad and talking to some family and friends uh, just the last few weeks and many of them complimented uh, towards my direction how they've seen God work in my life. And I've seen that as well. But I know in my own self, I have not arrived yet. There's a lot more that I need to grow in the grace of God, just like you need to grow. I hope all of us have grown just a little bit more this year than we did the previous year, 2022, right? I hope we all have. But the only way we can grow in grace is we first have to have a humble attitude. You can't be a know-it-all. If you're a know-it-all, you ain't gonna grow. 
You remember back in uh, the gospel accounts, Jesus is talking about judge not. You know, everybody loves that good old verse. But what he's saying in that passage, he says, hey, judge not, for you have a own beam in your own eye. You're judging people that have some sawdust in their eye, and you got this old big old beam sticking out of your own eye. Uh, focus on yourself. Humble yourself. You're not everything that you need to be, and neither are they. You don't get so caught up looking at everybody else and forget that you got a time that you had to grow. You say, man, why are they not where they need to be? Why are they not as strong as a Christian as I am? Well, you've been saved longer than them. Uh, maybe you've been around a different surrounding than them. Uh, we expect somehow when somebody gets saved that they're just gonna put on a suit and a tie and everything else in the same very day. That's not always so. It has been for many, but it's not always. It's gonna take a time of growth and in grace and we ought to be humble and remember when we look at somebody like that that we were at that point too we were not always where we are right now and this year if we're going to be a better we're going to need grace to have a humble attitude Without grace, you will not have a humble attitude, but you will have a prideful attitude. We're not better than any church in this area. I'm not a better Christian than anybody in this area and you're not either. But we ought to have a humble attitude. But Paul goes on and says something else in verse number 12. Look at it again. He says, but I follow after that if I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things uh, which are uh, behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Here's what you need to make sure when you're packing grace in your spiritual suitcase, when you have grace, you're gonna have a humble attitude, but you're also gonna have holy determination. Here's what you need. Paul is saying, look, I'm not everything that I ought to be, and you're not either, but I'm determined that I'm gonna press forward I'm gonna go forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm determined with everything that is inside of me that I wanna be better for Jesus Christ. How many of you wanna be better for the Lord Jesus Christ this new year? We have to have a holy determination, but you have to understand people have determination, but they don't always do something with that determination. I bet all of us have made the comment with family and friends that we probably need to start working out maybe uh, doing something to get a little bit of this fat. We have the idea that it's a good thing to do, but most of us ain't gonna go buy a gym membership and go out there. Now, I'm sure tomorrow the gyms are gonna be packed full of people. And man, the gyms are gonna love the memberships that they're gonna get for a good period of time. Then people forget to pay for their memberships and that's all another problem. But there's a lot of us that have a determination that we want to do something. Maybe it's a good thing. For example, I hope that all of us have a determination with inside of us that we want to read the Bible completely through this new year. I hope that's a determination. By the way, as a Christian, everybody ought to read the Bible completely through at least once. But I think it ought to be a determination, a, a goal of yours to read it every year. Because the only way people are going to see the Bible in you is if you put the Bible inside yourself first. I think that's a good thing. There's a lot of people say, I'm going to read the Bible through. Maybe they get one of those charts uh, that are normally given on this day. And they will have a list about reading maybe a part, uh, certain uh, couple of chapters in the Old Testament, a certain couple of chapters in the New Testament. And they got a little chart to write down check marks next to. But if they don't have a holy determination, if they don't have the grace of God, they're going to stop probably three or four days in, forget all about it, and never complete what they were originally going to do. But Paul here is saying, I'm determined that I'm going to press forward. I'm going to forget the things which are behind me. I'm going to go forward. You see, I've already told you, uh, Philippi, I've told you where God brought me from. I was a Christian killer. I thought I was better than everybody because I was so religious. But I learned by the grace of God, I'm not that great. I'm only good by the grace of God. And by that, I want to encourage you, you also need to press forward. I want to say that this morning you need to have a holy determination as we enter into this new year for three things. Number one, you need a holy determination in order to press forward. Uh, we all have the idea that we want to press forward, uh, but some of us don't. 
There's some people that don't want to press forward. They have no vision. They have no goal. I go ahead and tell you the White Horse Heights Baptist Church, our pastor, I'm sure Brother Tom, I'm sure every one of us has some visions that we want to accomplish this new year. But I hope that you have a vision. I hope you have an idea what you are expecting for this new year. We were called there in the book of Proverbs where there is no vision, the people perish. And I know our pastor has a vision for this new year. I have a vision for this Sunday school class. Brother Tom, I'm sure, has a vision uh, for our choir. I'm sure there's a lot of visions, but I hope that uh, we are not just going to have the vision. I hope we're going to do something with it. We have to press forward, and we're going to need the grace of God to do it. Secondly, we need to determine to be like Christ. Paul says that he is striving, he is looking, he is pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I hope that this next year you are already putting in your spiritual suitcase the grace of God to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what a Christian is? It's not just somebody that's saved. It's somebody that reflects Christ Jesus. And we all ought to reflect Christ Jesus to the very best. We may never get to his level. We won't. I'll go ahead and tell you, but we ought to strive. We ought to make that a goal because how else are we going to win our family? How else are we going to win our friends? How else are we going to win those coworkers with the gospel of Christ when they don't see Christ in us? Paul said, I may not have been what I was, but I want to be more, and I want to be more like Christ Jesus. We lift up the Apostle Paul so very much as being one of the greatest missionaries that ever existed. But as we read a little bit about Paul, we recognize back in Corinthians, he says that he was the least of the apostles. You skip forward to the book of Ephesians, he'll say he's the least of all saints. Then in 1 Timothy, he says he he was the chief of sinners. You know what he's doing? He's downgrading himself. He's humbling himself because as he grows in the grace of God, he's seeing he's not all that. And he's seeing that because he's becoming more like Christ Jesus. The closer you get to Christ, the least you think about yourself. And I believe that this year we ought to determine to be more like Christ. Thirdly, I believe we need to determine to get past our past. Now this year has not been an easy year for anybody. Some of us have made mistakes. Some of us have failed. Some of us have sinned ways that, man, we wish we could take back. We've said things to family or said things to friends that we wish we could take back, but we can't. You can't. And sometimes that's all the devil needs to stop you from going forward. Because as our pastor said earlier this year, he said, if you get caught up looking back, it won't be long until you're going back. And there's a lot of people that the reason they won't go forward and will not conform to the image of Christ is because they're still looking back on their past. Now, the Bible is very clear here. In our passage, he says in verse number 13, he says, forgetting those things. Uh, yeah, forgetting those things. I've skipped over here. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth and the things which are before. Now, the Bible terminology in our passage, to forget does not mean to fail to remember. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you're never going to forget what you've done. You won't. It's impossible. Our minds will always remember things, such as you mothers will always remember when you uh, birthed that little ba baby boy or that little baby girl. You'll always remember that. It was a special moment. You'll always remember that day you got married. You'll always remember that day you got born again. You'll remember some of those key events, and those are good things. And we like to think about those things, but we don't like to think about those bad things. When we made that bad comment to a family member, and now that family member doesn't want to do anything with us. 
or when we should have said something uh, to a friend with the gospel of Christ, but they saw us doing something entirely not Christ-like. And we wish we could change the past, but that's not reality. But what is Paul exactly saying? He says, we need to forget the past. We need to press forward. What is he talking about here? Here's what the Bible is talking about. When the Bible says to forget, it means no longer to be influenced or by or affected by the past. So when God promised to you and I uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 17, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Here's what he's saying. He's not suggesting that he will conveniently have bad memory loss. Wouldn't that be crazy if our God just had bad memory? That would be bad. I'd be concerned. I hope he wouldn't forget me, right? But that's not what it's talking about. He's not suggesting that because that's impossible with God. But here's what God is saying. God is saying, I will no longer hold their sins against them. I will no longer hold their sins against them. Their sins can no longer affect their standing with me or influence my attitude to them. Here's what God's saying. I'm not even, go, I'm making a decision. I'm not going to remember those things. So every time that you are disrespectful to God, every time that you blasphemed against God, every time that you looked at pornography, every time that you fornicated, every time that you took alcohol and drunk it to your lips, every time that you did something that was against God, God says, after I put the blood of Christ over you, I've chosen within myself not to remember those iniquities, not to remember those sins, for they've all been washed away by the precious blood of Christ. I will not remember them no more. Aren't you thankful that we serve that kind of God? So if that's how God works, what is Paul speaking about here? He's telling us that we need to make a decision. We need to determine to forget the past. Get past our past. What is he talking about? Well, the phrase simply here is what he's saying. We need to break the power of the past by living in the future. You see, Paul understood that he can't change his past. You remember Paul killed Christians. How many nights he would go to bed, have dreams when he saw Stephen. Every time he took a stone in his hand, every time that he captured some Christian in their own home as he saw their wife and their children crying, you think Paul ever forgot those kinds of things? Absolutely not. And Paul says, I can't change that, but by the grace of God, I'm gonna press forward. I'm gonna press towards the future. I can't change the past, but I can determine today what tomorrow will be. Warren Wearsby said, we cannot change the past, but we can change the meaning of the past. You remember Joseph Back in the Old Testament, Joseph, when he met his brothers that second time, you remember his brothers, they threw him away. They wanted nothing to do with Joseph. You think Joseph should have been bitter, should have held a grudge towards his brothers? By all means, by the flesh, we would say yes. But Joseph knew he couldn't hold on to that past if he was gonna move on to the future. So the second time he saw his brothers, he let go of the grudges, he let go of the bitterness, and he took them in and showed grace to them. There's gonna be people this year that have done some bad things to you. Maybe they have stolen from you. Maybe they've talked badly about you behind your back. But guess what? We've gotta let go of the past, look towards the future, and show a little bit of grace. That's what the Christian life is all about. There's gonna be people we won't always agree with about everything, but we can always be gracious. We always can be compassionate. And I think one thing that we need to make sure that uh, we do is we pack a little bit of that grace. If we're gonna be successful, if we're gonna have a good new year, we've gotta make sure we have that grace not only to have determination, a humble uh, uh, attitude, but we have to have that idea of having a holy determination so we can forget our past. If you're carrying bitterness into this new year, it won't be a good year. 
It'll be like what Lucy said. It'll be a used year. It won't be a good year. It won't be a new year. It'll be a used year. And there's a lot of people that won't let go of what somebody did to them. And then God can't take them where he wants them to go. We need the grace of God in our spiritual suitcases for the new year. I, I also wrote down, and I want to say this, you cannot change the past, but you can live for God today. Don't ruin your future by living in your past. This is what Paul is wanting to get across to you and I. You see, the unsaved person is controlled by their past. But the Christian is running a race looking towards the future. You remember in Hebrews chapter 12, he talks about running the race. Well, here in this passage, he's talking about looking forward. A couple of years ago, back when I was in high school, I ran for our cross country team. How many of you know what cross country is? Cross country is not an easy sport. You have to run about three miles. And you're trying to do it in a certain amount of time. Now, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know what cross country was either when I joined the team. They had been doing practices all summer, but I found out there was a girl at the time that I liked, and I thought maybe if I can get on the team, that it'll give me some more time to be with her. It didn't work out, but I went on a team. I joined the team, went to the first race, didn't even know what cross country was. I thought I was pretty fit. I thought I could maybe run a mile or so. I didn't think it would be too hard, but I found out after they shot that first gun and I got done with that first mile, I had two more left. <laughs> It wasn't easy at all. But I'll tell you, this is something our coach constantly put into our heads. Uh, she would tell us that at the end of the race, there's a, a stretch, a long, straight stretch. Every race that we went to, whether that was in the state or if we went to uh, the championships, whatever, we, I went to the championships twice during that time. And at every course that we went to always had a long stretch to where the finish line was, where we started from. Well, she said that every time we get to that point, you better give it all you got. You ought to be passing out as you're crossing that finish line. Otherwise, I know you didn't give it all you had. I'll be honest with you. There was multiple times, not only myself, but I saw others literally passing out. People getting sick on the finish line. I mean, people pushing their limits to what they possibly can do. And if you ever ran a little bit, you understand after you run a period of time, your side starts hurting. I mean, you're getting a headache. You're getting all kinds, and you just want to quit. But when you see that finish line, there's something that comes in your spirit that says, I got to give it all I got. And I would see people that felt like they were just going to be as slow as all can be. They would give it all they got. They were holding in a, a tank, if you may. And they gave it all that they could, running the best they could. And it was exciting, always cheering all on both sides as you're running. You're hearing, because you want to keep your eye. But I couldn't look over the person next to me. I couldn't see how they were running, where they were at. I couldn't look at the person on this side, and I definitely couldn't look on the back of who was behind me. My goal was that finish line. I had to keep my focus on that finish line. The entire race had to just keep my eyes focused straight. Here's what God wants you and I to do. He wants us to get our focus off of the past and onto the goal, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't take old dirt into new seasons this new year. Secondly, the thing that you need to make sure that you're packed for 2024, you're going to need to pack a goal, a goal. Now, I know that we use sometimes the phrase, you know, uh, New Year's resolutions, and maybe you have some yourself. That's always a good thing. I wouldn't discourage that. Some of us have goals for our lives. I have some personal goals, not only, you know, uh, secularly speaking, but spiritually speaking. I have some goals that I would like to accomplish uh, this new year. But I hope all of our goals, one of them specifically, ought to be in our spiritual suitcase should be to know Jesus. To know Jesus, look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says that I may know him. Paul knew Christ in the sense that he was saved. How many of you are saved this morning? Raise your hand. You're saved. 
How many of you want to know Jesus a little bit more than you do right now? We sing that song sometimes, I want to know more about my Lord. And that ought to be the attitude of every Christian, that we ought to know more about Jesus. But let me help you as you try to make a goal into knowing Jesus just a little bit more this new year. Write this down if you will. You need to first have a specific goal, a specific goal. You need to figure out what am I trying to get to. I can say I want to know Jesus. That's a good goal, but how? How am I going to do that? You need to write down some specific things in order to accomplish that goal. Maybe you're going to need to cut out some things out of your life. Maybe as much time on the phone. Maybe as much time watching sports. Whatever it may be. But you need to write down how specifically you're going to accomplish that goal. Secondly, you need to make sure it's a measurable goal. Something that is accountable, if you may. Like I said, some people do Bible readings. They'll get a chart that has a, a little box that they can put a check mark every time that they read it. So if they do get behind, they can go back and read a passage and catch up. It's something that they can measure. But maybe there's a goal in knowing Jesus that you want to put in your life, but you need to make sure that not only yourself is accountable, but you're maybe accountable to somebody else, somebody that you can measure, making sure you're making some progress towards that goal. Thirdly, you need to have something that's action-oriented, something that can be done about. Now, we can talk, Brother Tom, we can talk about having goals all day long. I can talk about how the goal that one day, you know, I want to make this sum of money. I, I want to do all these things. And that's a good thing. I'm not, but those are good things to uh, give the vision for a goal. But sometimes we need to put a little bit of feet to our goals and do something about it. So it needs to be action-oriented. Fourthly, it needs to be realistic. It needs to be a realistic goal. Now, we want to know Jesus. That is a realistic goal, to know Jesus. But how? Now, we can make all these ideas that I'm going to read the Bible five times this year. Now, some people can do that. I know but one preacher that reads his entire Bible in one month. It is possible. But, you, but not everybody can do that. Not everybody can do that. So you need to make a goal that's realistic, that you can accomplish. It may be hard a little bit at first, but it needs to be realistic. And then fifthly, it needs to be a timely goal. It needs to be something that you can kind of measure the time of how you're doing. It needs to be something that if you make up in your mind as a goal today, that you know you can finish it by this time next year. It needs to be timely. So we need to make sure that we pack a goal, firstly, to know Jesus, but also, secondly, to serve Jesus. I want to serve Jesus more this new year than I did this previous year. I hope you do too. I hope we are serving Jesus not only at church, but I hope we're serving him outside of these four walls. We don't always have to pass a plate, though that's a good ministry to have. Uh, we can always have a teaching. That's a good ministry to have. But all of us ought to be soul winners for the Christ Jesus. All of us ought to show the love of Christ everywhere we go. We ought to serve God more this new year. And you can think of some ideas there. And then thirdly, we not only need to know Jesus, not only to serve Jesus more, but we need to please Jesus. You know, we talked a little bit about this in the book of Acts, in chapter number two, that there are only, there's only one baptism, but there's many different fillings. How we all need to be spirit-filled. But you know, you and I cannot be spirit-filled, cannot accomplish the things that God wants for this church and not for our lives if we are not pleasing God first. What is in your life right now that you know is not pleasing God? The book of James talks about if you know it to be good and you do it not, then it is a sin. You think that if God thinks it's sin, you think that pleases God to know that you're doing whatever that may be? You say, well, there's no a verse that says, I shouldn't do that. Well, it, is it hindering your walk with Christ? Is it pleasing Christ? If you're not doing the things he already asked of you, that is clear in Scripture, black and white. Who's the last person you told the gospel? Who's the last person you led to Christ? What was the last time you read your Bible? Is this the first time all week you read the Bible? Is this the first time that we've prayed all week long? You know, there's a sin of prayerlessness. And I can go on about a long list, but if we're not doing the things God already puts down, then we ain't pleasing God. And if there's something in our life that's keeping us from doing those things, then that's not pleasing God either. 
We want to be spirit-filled this new year. So we need to pack grace, but we also need to pack a goal. Thirdly, we need to pack a guide. We need to pack a guide. Verse number 16, very quickly to this morning. Verse 16, the Bible says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. The word rule here speaks of measuring of a measuring rod, like a carpenter line or a measuring tape. Here it is speaking, though, of the Bible, which is the set standard that does not fluctuate. But if we're going to accomplish and make this the best year spiritually for our lives, you're going to need a guide. And what better guide than the scriptures? What better guide? The Bible is not a history book, but it deals with historical things. It's not a science book, but it deals with scientific things. It has the answers to every single problem that you're going to face this new year. But if you don't go to the guide, you're not going to know what to do. That's why our world is wandering about like chickens with their head cut off. They don't know what they're doing because they don't got a guide. But what bothers me worse is that there are people that say that they're a Christian and they don't know what to do. I'll tell you what their problem is. They're not in the word. You want to make a goal, make sure it's in your spiritual suitcase that this is your guide, the scriptures. Make sure you're spending time in the scriptures May I say, a Bible that is not falling apart usually belongs to someone who is not. This year, I had to get my first new Bible. This is my newest Bible I got back in October because my other Bible was falling apart, quite literally. I'm not bragging about that. I should have more Bibles that are falling apart. But it took five years for that one. It's gonna take time. I'm not saying go damage your Bible on purpose. That's not what I'm saying. But your Bible ought to be used. It ought, everybody ought to know that's your Bible, that you spend time in that. Your children, your grandchildren ought to know that that Bible that's sitting on that kitchen table, grandma, grandpa, they got in that Bible that morning because they know that's going to guide them through these years. So we need to have the scriptures to guide us. I thought this was interesting. I wrote this down. It will only take 72 hours to read the Old Testament. Only 72 hours. It only takes 18 hours to read the New Testament. I've been able to read the entire New Testament in one week. It's not that hard, actually. But I thought this was interesting. It only takes a total of about 90 hours to read your Bible. Only about 90 hours. Now, this new year is a leap year. And I looked it up. There are going to be 8,760 hours this new year. And if we were to tithe our time to the Lord, that would leave us 876 hours that we ought to give to Christ. So if it only takes 90 hours to read your Bible, then we ought to be able to read it quite often. But you know, you gotta make sure it's your guide first. Then uh, quickly, let me say this. Not only do we need to pack a guide that includes the scriptures, but we also need to include the spirit. By the way, I want to remind you, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you this morning. And the Holy Spirit will guide you to do certain things. Maybe we'll give money to somebody that you would not normally give money to. Maybe to say something to somebody that you wouldn't normally talk to. It'll, the Holy Spirit will guide you to do things that may not make a lot of sense right now. But sometimes we just got to listen to the Holy Spirit take that step of faith. And we'll find that every time that God's faithful. Every time. Follow the Holy Spirit. John, I won't read it, but look at John 16, 13 through 14. You'll see what I'm talking about, that the Holy Spirit, we have it. We won't turn there. We don't have time. But let me say this very quickly. Not only will the scriptures guide us, not only will the Spirit guide us this new year, but spiritual leaders will guide you. Aren't you thankful we have a pastor? Is he not a spiritual leader? That's why God gave him to us. He's an overseer. God's going to put people in your life that are spiritual leaders that are going to try to help you with spiritual things, whether that is the pastor, whether that's a deacon here at the church, whether myself as a Sunday school teacher, or maybe somebody that you believe is a mature Christian, somebody that takes... By the way, let me remind you, uh, women and men, then Acts, or Titus chapter number 2 talks about the aged men and the aged women are supposed to teach the younger men and the younger women. 
That's not only talking about the secular things, about like, you know, how the age of women are to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. By the way, we're not having a lot of that. Why else are young women getting divorced so quickly? I wonder why. Some of them is not being taught. Same thing for a husband not teaching the son how to love and treat his wife or how to take care of her family. We're not seeing a lot of that these days. And I'm talking, that's some secular stuff that are good things to do. But please understand that every one of us needs a spiritual leader in our life that will guide us to spiritual things. We won't turn there, but Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they must give it account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. It is so unprofitable for you to try to go through this Christian life without spiritual leaders. The book of Proverbs talks about it's wise to have a multitude of counselors. You ought to have some spiritual leaders in your life that can answer some questions, can help guide you, somebody you can talk to on a personal basis. Otherwise, without them, you're going to make some terrible mistakes. So that is three things you need to make sure that you have in your spiritual suitcase this new year. If we're going to have a successful new year, you're going to need the grace of God. You're going to need a guide. And you're going to need none other than the a goal. You need a goal, a goal than a, than a guide. Got a little bit out of order there. But I hope that will be a great blessing to us as we go into this new year. And I look forward to seeing what God is going to do here in this new year. It's hard to believe that this year has already come to an end. It feels like we just started. It feels like I just joined the church just not that long ago. But now it's almost been a year. Hard to believe. But let's pray now. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Uh, for the Bible. We thank you for the Holy Spirit this morning. We thank you for these guides that you give to us. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the men in our church. We thank you for the people you've put in our lives that have been a help to us spiritually. I'm sure, Lord, all of us could think of somebody that has impacted our lives greatly for the Lord Jesus, and we thank you for him. Lord, we thank you uh, for these things, and Lord, we thank you for this year. We thank you for what you've done, and Lord, we are looking forward to seeing what you're going to do. God, just give us the grace to follow thee. Help us to do everything that you want us to do.